morning. So today's reading is from Philippians 2, and we're going to read verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Am I on? I'm good. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the name above all names, for we know that by believing in that name we become your children. By that name we are pardoned of our sins. By that name you become the Lord of our life. Be with me this now as I bring this message. May they be your words, not mine. We praise you, we glorify you, and we love you. We ask these things. In the name above all names, Jesus. Amen. Last week, I started uh, a three-part um, series on the, the uh, Nicene Creed. And last week, we talked, or I talked about uh, God the Father. This week, I'll be uh, preaching on the, the Son of God. Uh, the Nicene Creed has one sentence about God the Father, but has six sentences about, about Jesus. And I'll, I'll read that today. And I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the, the only Son of God, from the Father uh, begotten before all time, light from light, true God from true God existing, not made of the same being as the Father, through whom all things came into being. That one for us humans, and on account of our sin, descended from heaven and became flesh by uh, the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin, and became a man, and was crucified for us by Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried, and rose again on the third day according to Scripture. And he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father and is coming again with glory to judge the living and the dead of whose kingdom there is no end. That's translation right out of the, the Greek, by the way. <laughs> huh? It's not. No, in uh, 325... A.D., uh, the Emperor Constantine uh, convened a council at Nicaea, a council of all uh, the bishops, actually patriarchs, what they were called, uh, of the entire Roman Empire, to settle a dispute over the divinity of Christ, basically. And again in 381, after his son had uh, had gotten rid of the Nicene Creed because he was an Arian. Another emperor later in 381 reinstated and added a few words to it about the Holy Spirit. I've got a book at home. Uh, it's written by three authors, uh, uh, W.T. Perkheiser, um, uh, Willard Taylor, and uh, and. Hmm? Richard, S. Richard S. Taylor. Richard, we went to church with Richard H. S. Taylor in Oregon. But Willard Taylor writes in his book, God, Man, and Salvation, Christ is definitive of all that is written in the New Testament, whether one is speaking of God, man, sin, salvation, the church, or the future life. We cannot speak biblically about any of these matters without reference to Christ. Therefore, any preaching or teaching in the life of the church that finally does not focus on Christ and his works is not truly Christian. 
So it was in the early church, and so it has been in the church throughout the ages as she has sought to propagate her faith, she, the, the church. But for, but for more than 2,000 years, there's been people that say the name Christ and have ideas about who Christ was they don't they're not Christian by any means because those are some of them real strange ideas but God has always raised up defenders of the faith all throughout uh, for the last 2,000 years one of those defenders of the faith and I got a article he read it was C.S. Lewis my first semester of college at the University of Idaho, I took a class called Introduction to Religion. And the class basically was a, a seminar with just uh, different people asking different questions. But the one thing that I had to do was read a book, something to do with Christianity, and, uh, and write a, a paper on it. Well, one of the books that, uh, that the professor offered was Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And this is a, a quote from that. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that is Christ, that he is, and they say, I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept him, accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something else. You cannot shut him up. Or you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. This always freaks me up. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with anything, any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And again, Taylor writes, it has been and still is the con conviction of traditional Christian thought that with a full acknowledgement all, of all the variations of expression concerning Christ in the New Testament, the early church faithfully transmitted, transmitted those words and works of deeds Jesus. Behind the record are trustworthy witnesses to Jesus and to Jesus' self-consciousness, that is to say, what he knew himself to be. In uh, Mark 14, 16 through 14, 61 through 62, he, at his trial, Jesus was asked by the high priest, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Jesus said, I am and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the great right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Pilate asked in Mark 15, 2, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, It is as you say. By the way, Eusebius, uh, who I referenced last week, uh, wrote that, that Pilate later fell into such calamities he committed suicide. John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father am one. John 8, 56 through 58, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he, said, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham born, was born, I am. In the Greek, that is ego eimi, which literally says, I, I am. Eimi means I am. You don't need the, the pronoun. 
there's 10 more of the I am statements there. In each, each place it's ego ami. I am the bread of life. That's John 6.35 and, and also John 6.48. I am the living bread, John 6.51. I am the light of the world, John 8.12. I am the door of the sheep, John 10.7. I am the good shepherd, John 10.11. I am the resurrection and the life, that's John 11.25. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. I am the true vine. I, was, I read someplace that if, if you only had the, the Gospel of John, and the only one book, you would have everything you need for salvation. You would know everything to know there is about God. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock I will build my church. On this statement, not on Peter, on that you are the Son of the living God. Some scholars have claimed that the title Son of God and Messiah can't be found in the Old Testament. Well, there's only about two times that the word Messiah is used in the Old Testament. But there's reference to the, to the Son of God and to the Anointed One and others. They just don't name it. One of those is Isaiah 9 6 for a child will be born to us a son will be given to us and the government will rest upon his shoulders and his name will be called literally a wonder of a counselor mighty God eternal father prince of peace and then Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So. We know who he was. The next question must be, why did he come to earth? Why did God... Son, leave heaven and come to earth. That one for us, mankind, defended from heaven for our salvation by becoming flesh by the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin and becoming a man. I wrote down these Greek words here. Kai halagos. Ain har let's see, no. Oh, kai halaga sarxa genata, kai eskenosen en humin. That means, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then the, and the word, I gotta back up here a little bit. and became a man, oh, no, eskenos, and it literally means set up a tunk, a tent. Skene is the word for tent, so he set up a tent, temporary living with us. Sin came into the world by Adam. Jesus paid the price for our sin. Having been crucified for us by Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, only to raise again on the third day as it was prophesied in, in uh, Scripture. My first uh, semester, again, that same class, uh, Introduction to Religion, the professor teaching the class was a United Methodist minister with a doctorate in comparative religion. And we were 
going talking about the resurrection and he made the statement that well the res resurrection was just figurative like he didn't re really raise from the dead and I was shocked really pretty shocked so I said well the Bible tells me that if he is not raised we are still in our sins now that kind of shocked him he didn't say much after that but after the class, one of the students, a young lady <coughs> named Kathy, came up to me and uh, said, I'd never heard that before. I'd never heard that. And she was the pastor of a United Methodist Church just north of, of uh, Moscow down there. Then again, in uh, 1990, Vicki and I and our Sarah moved to Jennings Lodge, Oregon, to where I enrolled in... Uh, Western Evangelical S Seminary. And one of the classes was uh, Introduction to Theology. It was taught by a, a man named Tony Casarella. And it was a seminar class where there were six of us sitting around a table and just discussing scripture. And I, again, it came to the resurrection and he asked the question, how do you prove the resurrection? Now to each one of us, he asked that question. And all the way around the class, there were answers, and they were good answers, you know, proof. And he just kept shaking, shaking his head. Finally, he said, you can't. You have to accept it by faith. And that... He then ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Um, and that ascension, many, many people saw that. After Pentecost, there were saw, people literally saw him raise into, into heaven. But he has promised to come again. And he has come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. And of his kingdom there will be no end. I read this uh, the other day in uh, The Cost of Discipleship by, by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Now, Diedrich Bonhoeffer published this book in, in 1937. 1935, Hitler took over uh, leadership of the church and declared himself basically uh, replacing Christ. But Bonhoeffer said, May God protect his holy gospel from being obscured and profaned by false doctrine and unholiness of living. May he ever make known his name, his holy name, to the disciples in Jesus Christ, may he enable all preachers to proclaim the pure gospel of saving grace, and defend us against the tempters, and convert the enemies of his name. And with that, I'm going to end the... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be as steadfast in our faith as Bonhoeffer and Lewis and the early church fathers. Help us to realize the true value of knowledge uh, knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I oh, ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you for coming.